Professor uh, Ed Lee, the director of our IP program. I'm also the co-director of one of our centers, the Chicago Ken Center for Design, Law, and Technology. And we have another center uh, that is sponsoring this talk, our Center for Empirical Studies of Intellectual Property. And I'll speak a little bit more about my empirical study uh, in a minute. Uh, now, I also wanted to make sure to say welcome, uh, especially to the first years. Welcome to everybody, but especially to the first years uh, who may be attending your first IP event. Uh, we have a lot of IP events scheduled for this year, and I'm uh, happy to share with you a calendar of those events. Uh, we've launched a new web page where you can find basically uh, everything about our IP program uh, that, to your heart's desire. Uh, if you go to this website, uh, kenlaw.iit.edu slash IP, uh, you will find this and this page. And this page will provide you the organization and uh, essentially uh, links to, I think, all the information that you uh, want about our IP program. And the conferences tab has the calendar of events. Uh, so we are working with uh, our Intellectual Property Law Society, our student group that many of you 1Ls who are here, uh, I hope you will be joining and they will soon be having your or first organizational event. At least this semester's events, IP events, uh, head to the conferences tab and uh, you can map out your calendar uh, to attend many of these events. And you'll re be receiving email announcements as well as, as these events progress. Now let's get right to the talk. Uh, what I plan on doing is speaking hopefully for maybe 20, 25 minutes and then giving you some opportunity to ask questions. This year, uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in uh, mainly in California, where this case was tried, affirmed the verdict in a very high profile music case involving Pharrell, Robin Thicke, on the one side, and on the other side, uh, the estate of Marvin Gaye, the late Marvin Gaye. Uh, the two songs that were the basis of this lawsuit were, first of all, a 1977 hit by, written by, by Marvin Gaye uh, called Gotta Give It Up. Uh, some 36 uh, years later, uh, I'm expecting that many of you know this other song that was the number one song of 2013, Lyric Lines. That was written by Pharrell and Robin Thicke. So we're actually going to listen to an instrumental version of both songs, just 30 seconds of them, uh, because the nature of this lawsuit, the copyright extended to the musical work, and I'm not going to go into uh, depth about the difference between a musical work and a sound recording, uh, but nonetheless, that's why what was presented to the jury was an analysis of the musical composition, uh, which included, I believe, a, a performance that was the instrumental version. This wasn't the exact performance in the trial, uh, but this was this is enough for our purposes to get a handle of what, what's going on. So let's let, let's listen first to 30 seconds of "Got to Give It Up." It's always great when technology works, at, uh, especially at Chicago Cats where we're known for our technology uh, in law school. Okay, so this song was number one on the Billboard Top 100 uh, for, I believe, at least a week. It is still uh, licensed today uh, in uh, audiovisual works, for instance. So it's a still a popular hit, and it's a, a hit that uh, Pharrell and Robin Thicke were aware of at the time that they created their song. So let's take a, a listen to uh, 30 seconds of, of their uh, hit, Blur of Lines. Okay. 
Okay, terrific. So as a part of the case, in addition to hearing the uh, performance of the instrumental version of the musical works, uh, the jury also heard testimony from musicologists, people who study uh, music composition. On both sides, the experts were presented. Uh, for the side of Marvin Gage's state, I think this was presented as part of the uh, similarity, alleged similarity between the two compositions. Uh, I have a former research assistant here who is a musician. I don't know if you want to opine on this uh, similarity. I don't read musical notes, or I don't anymore at least. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have uh, a, a, quick, a quick view of what I highlighted that was the alleged, uh, at least one of the alleged similarities? Oh yeah, so the, first of all, the length of the quarter notes would be similar, and the modulation between what they're calling three and I guess number two. So it would be like two notes sure. in a row of number three and then down to number two and then back up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Saffron, for that excellent testimony. He's our expert for today. So that was, I mean, that's essentially a music uh, infringement lawsuit where you're bringing in evidence, and it often turns on, you know, testimony from the expert pointing out uh, either there is a similarity or there's a non-similarity. So just to uh, take a quick poll of our class based on this limited amount of evidence that you've heard, uh, by a show of hands, let's say, how many people think that the two songs are substantially similar? They're substantially similar. How many people think that they're not substantially similar? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so it looks like more people thought they are substantially similar than uh, not. Uh, let's take a, another uh, poll on a second question. Does Blurred Lines by Pharrell and Robin Thicke add something new with a further purpose or different character, altering Gotta Give It Up, Marvin Gaye's song, with new expression, meaning, or message? How many people think that, yes, it does? Okay, and then how many people think, no, it does not? Okay, well, that's pretty, uh, that's, close to the unanimous unless there were abstentions. So most people agree that it would, uh, it does, uh, add new meaning to Marvin Gaye's song. Well, as, the, as many of you know already, uh, the result was that the jury found in favor of infringement, uh, in favor of Marvin Gaye's estate for over $7 million, was eventually cut back to $5 million. That figure represents roughly 50% of the profits obtained from uh, Pharrell's and Robin Thicke's song. So essentially the jury is saying, we believe the success of your song was 50% attributable to what you copied from Marvin Gaye's song. What's interesting about the way that this case was litigated was that Pharrell and Robin Thicke made no defense of fair use, which in many copyright lawsuits is a pretty typical defense where there's some evidence that suggests the defendants did copy. Uh, instead, uh, Pharrell and Robin Thicke argued that there was simply no infringement, there was no similarity, and anything that was apparently similar constitutes uncopyrightable uh, elements that were common to the 1970s style of music. Now, uh, was it a mistake for them not to raise that defense of fair use? Based on the poll that we just did, I think, yes, it, 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 it was a mistake. Because one of the key ingredients to making a fair use defense is so-called factor one. What was the purpose of using the pre-existing work that was copyrighted? Here are Marvin Gaye's work. And, uh, if the purpose was transformative, the courts value that in favor of fair use. Now you have to run through all four factors, but the language that I just showed you about adding new meaning, new expression to what you've used before, 
is a very important part of the fair use analysis and actually is considered to be, I think, a weighty uh, factor in favor of fair use uh, in most fair use decisions. Now, another reason why it would have seemed consistent to raise a fair use defense for Pharrell and Robin Thicke is that before this lawsuit was filed, Robin Thicke, in an interview with GQ, described their composition as intending to make something like that song with that group, uh, referring to Marvin Gaye's song. Uh, I, I don't know if I can impersonate uh, Robin Thicke, but he was like, Pharrell and I were in the studio, and I told him that one of my favorite songs of all time was Marvin Gaye's got to give it up. I was like, damn, we should make something like that, something with that group. So that's already saying you borrowed something from before. And unless you are just conceding that what you're doing is uh, committing infringement, the no-brainer defense would be uh, a fair use defense, which always involves some borrowing or copying of somebody else's work that is protected by copyright. So that's another reason why you would think that uh, Pharrell and Robin Thicke would raise this uh, fair use defense. Now, their account of what happened changed later on. So eventually, for instance, uh, Robin Thicke said he was high in Vicodin, and Pharrell <laughs> created this all by himself. Uh, so their explanation of, co of how they composed the song changes over time. Uh, but on the original explanation uh, in GQ, uh, one thing to note is that it's not necessarily an admission of infringement. Uh, there is this defense called fair use that enables people to build on copyrighted works uh, subject to this kind of balancing of factors to see if it truly is a fair use that is considered to be uh, reasonable or fair. Now, the interesting part that gets to my survey of music cases is that it turns out the approach taken by Pharrell and Robin Thicke is the rule and not the exception in music cases. By far, most music cases do not involve an assertion of fair use, much less the court deciding the case on fair use. Uh, in order to find out that fact, uh, I did an empirical survey of all music cases involving two competing musical works that one was uh, as, as alleged to have infringed the copyright of the other musical work. From the start of our Copyright Act, which went into effect January 1st, 1978, to January of 2018, January of this year. Uh, and uh, just as a, as a small uh, footnote, uh, this paper idea, I have to admit, I had back uh, in 2000 or 2001, uh, when I was a fellow at Stanford Law School, and I was auditing a course, a copyright course by Professor Goldstein, one of the gurus of copyright, uh, and we were going through uh, famous music infringement cases, and uh, I, came, I went up to him uh, after the class, one, one of the classes about music infringement, and I asked him, I said, why is it any defendant asserting fair use for any of these? And he said, wow, great question. Uh, and his explanation was that uh, fair use developed as at first in the context of literary works or textual works and doing quotations as the paradigmatic fair use. Uh, and I think that's an accurate historical description of how fair use developed, but you know, today fair use applies to all works. Uh, I was working on other scholarship at the time, so I didn't pursue it. And it was not until the Pharrell case, when they didn't assert it either, when I thought it was crying out for a fair use defense, you know, putting aside whether they would have prevailed or not, but it just seemed like the facts did fit a fair use defense. That's what sparked this uh, survey. Okay, so uh, the survey is out in the Boston College Law Review, and there's a link to on the Eventbrite that was sent out, I believe, to this article. If not, please email me and I can send you the link. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I will hit the highlights of this uh, study. I think the first thing to know, this is just a basic fact. Uh, it's not too, uh, I think, uh, too much of a watershed you know, point, but 
it's something important to realize that there are a lot of music infringement cases, roughly 4.5 a year, uh, which is not surprising though, given that you know, for the, all those musicians in the room, there are a limited number of musical notes and also a limited number of combinations of notes that sound harmonious. So eventually, uh, there's going to be another composition that probably sounds similar to a previous composition as more and more compositions are out there. And copyright lasts a long time, uh, like the author plus 70 years. So a lot of musical works are still copyrighted, uh, which I'll talk about at the end of the uh, talk today. Now, in comparison, this doesn't seem like a lot, 4.5 a year. But in comparison to other types of works, for instance, choreographic works, uh, sculptural works, uh, pantomimes, pantomimes are a category of work. Uh, we don't see this constant you know, uh, set of cases, a handful of cases on average every year, uh, which suggests to me, which makes it a little bit more puzzling and why we have not seen fair use uh, in music cases come up uh, until recently. And I'll talk about that until recently in a minute, or a couple minutes at least. Okay. So in my universe of cases, there were 177 disputes involving these two musical works, one of which was alleged to be infringing the copyright of another. Uh, there were 127 that were decided by the point in January of 2018, and that's uh, the set of cases that I primarily focused on for the purposes of determining whether fair use was a factor. Okay, so the second major finding of this study is that, and I've already alluded to this, fair use is rarely asserted in these music infringement cases, uh, and not surprisingly then, very rarely uh, actually a decided issue in a case involving two uh, musical works, uh, especially in non-parody songs. Uh, for those of you who have studied copyright, or will be studying, or are studying copyright, you will study Probably the most important fair use case, uh, Acuff Rose, uh, Campbell versus Acuff Rose. That case involves two competing musical works, but it, it's a special kind of song considered to be a parody, uh, which uh, comments on or criticizes the other song uh, and sometimes makes fun of the other song. Whereas in a non-parody situation, what we really haven't seen until recently are cases involving musical works asserting a non-parody fair use. And even the ones that we've seen are just two, uh, maybe three, at most. Okay. Now, this is a sort of a visual representation of the point that I just made. Uh, it is in the paper or the draft uh, that you uh, can see online if this is hard to read. Uh, just to highlight a, a couple points, uh, and I'll get to this in a related point, um, most of the cases the defendants prevail. Uh, so in some respects, fair use is not needed because other doctrines are helping defendants prevail and avoid uh, finding of infringement. But curiously, and this is the part about Robin Thicke and, and Perel, even those cases, and sorry, this is a little bit misaligned, even those cases in which the defendants are losing, they're not typically asserting a fair use. And that, to me, is uh, surprising. Uh, because in, I think in other contexts with other types of works, you would see it you know, as at least an alternative defense, if not the main defense, when there is some evidence of copy involved. Okay, and this is the point I just mentioned. So another finding of this survey is defendants have prevailed in a large majority of cases litigated so far. Uh, they've done so uh, on basically the test of infringement. So one component is substantial similarity that you all voted on and the majority of you found infringement or at least enough on this element of infringement, uh, substantial similarity. Uh, there was no question Pharrell and Robin Thicke had access to the work, they admitted they knew the work. Uh, so that it would have come, up, come down to that test of infringement that most of you said there, there was substantial similarity. Uh, the one case that was included in the study which involved a non-parity fair use, excuse me, this one, uh, 
uh, was it a case involving Drake in which the copying involved actually just words, spoken words, and it arguably didn't even involve a musical work since there was no music. But I included it in the study because the district court seemed to assume, based on the plaintiff's allegation, it was a musical work. So uh, that's the one case that I've included as a successful non-parity fair use. And there's a more recent case that just uh, came out after my study involving the notorious B.I.G. Uh, involving also, uh, excuse me, a lyric. Uh, a lyric that was copied as a part of uh, another song. Uh, and that case uh, comes uh, from the Southern District of New York. Uh, so those are the only two cases so far that I found that have uh, recognized non-parity fair use. And it's only in the context of lyrics, which I think in some respects is not too surprising because as I said before, quotation is considered a paradigmatic example of a fair use. Quotation of workers. So not surprising courts would feel comfortable in recognizing their copying of musical notes, like we did the analysis of the musicologist, what they would do. Uh, that yet is yet to be the subject of a fair use decision. Now, why do we have this situation in which defendants that lose in music infringement cases are not even asserting fair use defenses, uh, putting aside these two cases involving lyrics? Uh, first of all, uh, I've already mentioned this point. Uh, defendants have won on a lot of other grounds in the past. Uh, uh, over 80% the defendants have won, 80% uh, of cases the defendants have won. And in parentheses I put MTD, motion to dismiss. Uh, the way the courts have interpreted the test of infringement is that they can even look at uh, the allegations in the complaint uh, and the arguments presented by parties and sometimes reject a case simply based on those allegations using the test of substantial similarity. It's a pretty aggressive approach to the test of substantial similarity, but it's a convenient way to dispose of cases the court thinks is, is I don't know, frivolous, but non-meritorious at the very least. Okay, so that's one reason for why we haven't seen it, uh, I think, to some extent. Another reason is, I think, uh, more of a historical artifact, and this relates to the response that Professor Goldstein gave to me way back in 2000 when I first had this sort of research question. Uh, the courts used to interpret the copyright law as permitting some amount of borrowing of music composition to create another composition. Before this current Copyright Act, the 1976 Act, you will find decisions of courts that say expressly you know, music borrowing is permissible, you know, in certain contexts, uh, in part recognizing that there are a limited amount of musical notes. I think that was a prevailing view, and that prevailing view was encapsulated by one famous commentator, uh, Judge Kaplan, Benjamin Kaplan, in his famous book, An Unhurried View of Copyright, where he expressly says this. You can do this deliberately. Music borrowing, you can copy uh, music deliberately and he characterizes it as you manipulate what you have taken. And that sort of sounds like transform, transformative use, but uh, at that time when he was writing, uh, that was not uh, yet clearly recognized as part of the test of fair use. Fair use had been recognized at this time, but it was not codified in the Copyright Act until 1976. Uh, now, uh, uh, a footnote point to this uh, explanation is that I think fewer courts are recognizing this permissiveness to music borrowing as a matter of infringement or non-infringement. So there is a change in the scope of copyright or the, the application of the test of substantial similarity. Another reason, and this reason I, you know, I cannot prove to you, uh, is uh, actually a, a reason, but I just throw it out there as a hypothesis based on uh, what I've read uh, submitted by uh, the music industry. But the music industry I'm referring 
mainly to the recording industry and the publishers, the national, like for instance, the National Publishers Association, uh, and as well as you know, large publishers of, of musical works. I think it's probably a fair to say they're not a, a big fan of fair use or not a big fan of uh, broad fair use in part of fear that it will, it will open the door to all sorts of remixes, not just by established artists, but by everybody. Now, everybody who wants to create a musical composition will start copying elements without permission. And I think that's uh, something that the music industry uh, fears. Uh, so backing fair use, raising it, uh, creating a precedent that copying music is a fair use in some circumstances, uh, you know, provides a precedent for other cases. And I think that's what, one thing that they're particularly leery of. There is another way that uh, the establishment in the industry, uh, I think, prefers these sorts of disputes to be handled. And that's the paying of royalties and the giving of songwriting credit uh, by uh, the defendant uh, who is alleged to have copied to the uh, copyright owner of the song that is allegedly copied. And this happens all the time with some of the you know, most famous artists that we have today, uh, Bruno Mars, I'll talk about this at the end of the talk as well, Bruno Mars, uh, Sam Smith, uh, Katy Perry, I mean, you name it, if you do a Google search, you'll find that this kind of uh, licensing and giving of credit, songwriting credit, even if you disagree that you've copied anything, uh, as Sam Smith has maintained, he doesn't believe what he did was anything involving copying. Uh, the artist might agree to uh, this uh, path as opposed to a lawsuit which would require a fair use. So that's a hypothesis I threw out there. This may not be a defense that is particularly uh, welcomed by uh, at least some in the music industry. Uh, shorthand way to say this is that you have to pay to play, basically, uh, with any part that you have copied. Uh, another reason that m might explain why uh, we have seen defendants avoid fair use defenses in these music cases is what I characterize as potentially a, a feedback loop. Uh, that the attorneys especially go with what has worked before and we have seen a high success rate with defenses based on the test of infringement, which has the added value that you potentially get a motion to dismiss and kick the case out very early. Uh, so that reinforces the positive, in a positive way, a positive feedback loop, uh, the things that have worked, and in a negative way, uh, what is unclear, at least for fair use. What's the scope of fair use as applied to copying of musical elements? Uh, that is, I think, much more unclear uh, than, uh, let's say, a parody fair use uh, context. Uh, so versus a non-parody song. Okay, so those are some uh, reasons that I threw out there as possible explanations for what we have seen. And I uh, cannot prove that uh, all of these, or one particular one, best explains uh, this uh, phenomenon. But I think uh, at least a combination of them probably provides uh, some basis of an explanation for what has happened. Uh, now, with the remaining uh, few minutes I have left, I wanted to kind of ask the question on a kind of a normative front, whether this is problematic. Some of you may think that, well, the defendants have won in most cases and you know their music is allowed and considered not to be infringing and they don't have to you know pay royalties and give songwriting credits. Ultimately, you know, society is benefiting creation of more music, uh, uh, composers have the freedom to create, and there's no chilling, so-called chilling effect on the way that they compose, compose, compose music. I don't think that is the case uh, today. Uh, for one reason, we've seen that with uh, Pharrell's case, uh, you know, they're on the hook in, for the rest of the term of copyright of Marvin Gaye's song, uh, for payment of 50% royalties 
and uh, I mean, obviously they have to give songwriting credit as well. Uh, another reason uh, that is why we should be concerned about the lack of a fair use precedent for non-parody uh, songs is what I've characterized as a kind of copyright clutter. Uh, so just imagine we have all of our musical compositions that are still under copyright. And any work created from 1923, published in 1923, is still under copyright, assuming it is uh, properly applied for the renewal term. Uh, and that includes so, potentially millions of works. Uh, you know, not all of those are commercially viable today, but certainly uh, some are. And if it's under copyright, uh, there's another wrinkle that's added to this equation. The way that our copyright statute limitations operates is that it's a, what's called a three-year look-back period. So even if a dispute arose, let's say, in 1923 or 1924, and the parties could have you know, filed a lawsuit, if today those works are still under copyright and uh, there's you know, sort of continuing uh, infringement going on today, uh, the, the copyright owner of the song that is allegedly infringed would not be precluded by simply waiting. Uh, so in a case recently or a few years ago, the Supreme Court decided called Petrella, the Supreme Court said there is no equitable doctrine of latches for the defendant to assert for uh, a copyright owner to have waited too long. You just go by the statute of limitations, it's just a three-year period, just a look-back period. So some of you may be familiar with the Led Zeppelin trial that occurred a couple years ago. Led Zeppelin was sued by a band chorus for infringement that allegedly occurred in the 1970s. Started in the 1970s, but since the you know, song is still out there, Stairway to Heaven, uh, you could still sue today and just uh, limit your damages to three years before. So this combination of statute of limitations, long term of copyright, makes a lot of musical works uh, and their copyrights potentially the basis for a lawsuit. Uh, and the way that I like to depict this visually is you can imagine this entire work is copyrighted as a musical composition, but what might end up happening under this scenario is that discrete portions few combinations of notes are copyrighted in themselves. There's an argument that you know, this is the distinctive part of this musical composition. And if this happens, if there's any similarity in note, or, or notes, that's, I don't know if somebody's claiming just one note that's copyrighted. I'm going to assume that it's going to be more than one note. Uh, and you can't copyright just one note. But a combination of notes, copyrighted, uh, you're bound to create something that's similar to something that's already under copyright, even if you did not intentionally copy. Now, fair use provides a defense even if you intentionally copy, as long as under the balancing of factors, uh, the court or jury finds it constitutes a fair use. But if you didn't copy at all, uh, and you've independently created, uh, that is supposed to be permissible under our copyright law, but it's, it's often hard to prove, uh, and I think jury, juries may be influenced by things that sort of sound alike. Now, what this has led to, uh, I've already referred to two of these, these two examples, but there are many more that you could find, is that you know, some of our most uh, acclaimed artists, especially the young artists, uh, have been subject to lawsuits in which they have settled uh, the claims of infringement because their songs sounded similar. Uh, this interesting article in Spin uh, Magazine uh, suggests that in the dispute with Sam Smith, Tom Petty's uh, compositions are fairly uh, basic, so it would not be surprising to find other songs that are similar. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, accurate as a that sort of music analysis, but there's at least one uh, author in the music field uh, suggesting that you would expect some similarity. Uh, and uh, Bruno Mars, with his uh, runaway hit, Uptown Funk, you know, I mean, he was trying to harken back to, to sounds 
from an earlier day involving funk, but give it, you know, I think, a, a more contemporary sound that would capture the interest of today's music consumers. And it did. Uh, he is one of the most successful artists in history, not just of recent artists, but of history. Uh, and yet he is subject to numerous lawsuits. Now, it, I don't want to prejudge those cases. I don't know enough about those cases. But it, it might be that some are legitimate claims of infringement uh, and maybe some are. But what I think this does show is that it, it is so easy to compose something that sounds similar to at least an element of something copyrighted, the so-called copyright clutter. And without the availability or at least the clear precedent for fair use involving non-parody songs, uh, I think it might uh, hamper the compositions of our composers or songwriters today in a way that ultimately also uh, leads to uh, you know, consumers of music suffering as well. Society does not benefit if things that uh, some composers want to create that will be perfectly acceptable under fair use are not being created today. Okay, so I think I've spoken enough about this survey. Uh, as I said, if you want to read the actual article, uh, it goes into much more depth, the explanations and the results. Uh, and now I will just open the floor to comments or uh, questions about this. Yes, Beth Baer. Um, if the composers had a fair use defense in the cases that you mentioned, where it just happens, if the compositions are insane. So if the fair use defense was available, wouldn't that be lying though? So they would have to go to court and say, it didn't just happen. Yes. Sounds, Sounds inconsistent with a defense that says, I did not copy. Uh, so one thing that you, you will learn uh, during my class, my one on class, uh, you will learn uh, is that uh, lawyers are permitted in uh, defending uh, clients or putting forth positions, not permitted to lie, but to argue in the alternative. To argue defense theory A to say no copying. But in the alternative, if you are inclined to find copying, this nonetheless constitutes fair use. Sometimes the way that the cases are managed they, they could go, for instance, straight to the fair use defense. And they say, assume copying fair use. There is, you're right to, to point out there is a logical inconsistency in those positions. Uh, but the nature of the way uh, our uh, courts uh, operate in terms of allowing arguments by uh, parties, uh, there is nothing inappropriate or wrong about arguing in the alternative, having that as the uh, you know one defense theory, one plaintiff theory, and a second theory, for example. Great question, though. Yes. Um, in any of the cases that you saw, was there um, an instance of copyright uh, clutter where you think there were more, there's more than one suit instance that you saw for copyright Oh, definitely. Uh, that's the Bruno Mars case. Uh, he, he had at least, I think, three groups of uh, songs. Yeah, the same song infringed their work. And I'm not sure if he said of all of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're from the 70s, I believe. Uh, and that's, you know, the period that he's trying to harken back to. Uh, and, and one thing that I, I think I didn't mention this in the talk, but it's in my article that I think is helpful to point out of why I find fair use attractive. Fair use requires a balancing of factors that approximates a balancing of interests. Balancing of the interests of the copyright owner, of the borrower, and of society. And that's not present in a simple analysis of substantial similarity. You just say, oh, the two words are similar. Whereas in fair use, you actually can't consider the harm, the economic impact to the copyright owner, how much was taken, but also this notion of purpose, this transformative purpose whether it's adding something new to our uh, storehouse of knowledge or of music in this case. Uh, so that's, I think, one ingredient 
or one facet that fair use brings in that's a more uh, nuanced analysis that considers uh, these problematic cases where there might be copyright clutter and let's you know let's evaluate how much was taken does, has, is this hurting the artists the copyright owners from before and that kind of thing and that's why I think it's an attractive defense that should be available be helpful to be available okay. Other questions? yes so we uh, went over Robin Thicke uh, saying he was high and drunk but we didn't talk about Pharrell just did not so, I mean, this case was a very, uh, I don't know, strong argument about artists not knowing here. Uh, were there any other cases where like artists made ridiculous statements like that? Yeah, not that I'm uh, aware of offhand. I, I have to think about that question some more. Uh, it, so to go back to your remark, it did seem as though both Pharrell and Robin Thicke uh, could have been better prepared for their deposition, for instance. Uh, and uh, I think in our copyright class, we watched part of the, it was a video, you could see these online actually, video deposition of Pharrell, uh, who seemed just very hostile to the questioning uh, going on. Uh, and you know, that does not, I think, play well uh, in terms of uh, the court or if it's the jury. Uh, if this went before the jury, etc. Um, so that may also be a part of the equation. Uh, but what's nice about the fair, if you go back to fair use defense, is that you know they could embrace the GQ explanation, right? The GQ explanation is like, yes, we were trying to make it sound like that grew, but you know this is a completely 21st century song, and I think it's probably fair to say that. Uh, no one would mistake blurred lines for a song from the 70s. I, mean, I don't think there's just, there's just no way that, uh, that that's going to be considered uh, a representative song of the 70s. So it does seem to fit the conclusion that many of you drew that there is new meaning. It was transformed. There's a different character to that song than what had come before in the 70s. Yes, this gentleman. Regarding the um, possibility of the music industry resisting this for this other possible reason you mentioned. Um, describe the independent artists having kind of an open floodgate if they were able to, uh, if fair use was used. Is there anything precluding independent artists from using that defense now, aside from the financial resources to take it higher in court? No. There's nothing legal that is precluding them. Uh, I, I think I go through this in the article suggesting maybe uh, it'd be harder for the independent artist to assert it if they think that that's uh, persona non-defense, so to speak, of the music industry. Like, if they want to become established, why ruffle feathers by a, try, you know, a trying to assert fair use? Uh, so what we've seen in terms of the fair use defenses that have come out recently, it turns out they're all established artists, big artists, you know, Drake. Uh, notorious B.I.G. Uh, Beyonce asserted fair use, but not in the context of a musical composition, but she borrowed from a video. Uh, and that case is still going on right now. Uh, so maybe these artists who are more established and who have a lot more authority behind them. I think Beyonce has their own label, for instance. So, you know, they don't have, I mean, to the extent that there is this mu music industry uh, preference of avoiding the fair use, then, you know, some of these big players who uh, could do what they want, so to speak, uh, might be the ones who eventually uh, raise the fair use defense in a way involving musical elements. Uh, so that's one, another hypothesis that I've, I've thrown out there. Uh, but it's interesting to see the recent invocations of fair use are not coming from the independent artists, but are coming from, uh, I think, artists who are considered to be pretty successful, established artists. Yes. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to, 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 to put it back. This is a long time ago, but in the 70s, the, or late 70s, the Bee Gees defended um, a lawsuit uh, brought claiming that Heidi Your Love was a copy of um, uh, prior work by uh, professing their inability to read music very well. So it's not actually 
that unusual that you get that type of uh, argument. This is not unheard of, though. They might try that. But I actually had a question for you, Ed, on I mean, it's a fascinating study. And the, I, I think there may be both a descriptive reason why they might not do it, uh, which is to do with our limited capacity to understand the meaning of music in a way that we understand the meaning of words. It's not a surprise to me that Campbell, uh, you know, two-like crew, it's the lyrics of two-like crew that actually tells you what they're trying to say more than I think probably music least to me, but I'm maybe not musically talented enough. And I think we we probably understand the meaning of words a little more easily in the fair use test, even though come up in a music case, instead of talks about meaning. So that's my answer descriptively. Prescriptively, I, and normatively, I wonder whether there's an interesting comparison to software. Right? So I, I wonder whether if you did the same study on software, what the percentage is, I suspect it's pretty low in software compared to say artistic works. Uh, not standing Google and Oracle, but that's the second best argument. And the reason why you might think of it as a second best argument, if you argue it at substantial similarity and say, look, that's just a standard musical technique. You know, that modulation happens all the time, all those chords always happen uh, in that particular order, that's unprotectable in your substantial similarity analysis. You actually end up with less clutter because that's unprotectable anywhere, right? And that's what Altai did in software. Whereas if you do fair use, you're saying this stuff is protectable, but how do you use it? So in fact, you might long term sort of avoid the clutter problem by making more sort of substantial similarity arguments if you do this at all time move of saying that's the yeah. standard t technique of music. Yeah, for those who want to learn else in the room, that's Professor Dinwiddie back there no. uh, of our IP, also teaches IP. Uh, you'll see him uh, in, in classes as well as other events. So I just want to make sure introduce them. Uh, yeah, those are two uh, great points. Um, you know, I think in terms of the, to, to do the computer software one first, uh, that was, I think, more of the understanding of musical composition as I referred to before, the 1976 Act, where borrowing of elements was just routinely recognized in cases and in commentary as being uh, permissible, borrowing or whatever. Uh, what I, I think has shifted is the understanding of the scope of copyright for musical works. And there, there's, a, what a, there's a Harvard Law Review article that discusses this ambiguous term, musical work, that's undefined in the Copyright Act. And courts have had different understandings of that, and I think the Pharrell case, it was a pretty sort of capacious understanding of the musical composition. That was something that was, uh, the scope of the copyright for the musical composition was hotly contested, and that's why it led to this instrumental version as opposed to the, uh, the sound recording. Uh, so I'm not optimistic, I guess I would say, that we would return back to some understanding where small portions uh, or notes uh, are uncopyrightable. There's some case law recognizing that, either on the de minimis directly or uh, de minimis defense directly, or based on the, I had it as a category, even if it's copied, it was uncopyrightable, uncopyrighted all. You do see some of that, uh, but I think you see less, you see more of that with uh, words, actually lyrics, as opposed to uh, uh, musical elements uh, of copying. It was an interesting argument as to whether the groove, as he's quoted, right? whether, whether the groove of a musical work is copyrighted. Yes, you, and that's what uh, Pharrell later is arguing, that what they meant was there was an element uh, that was just in the public domain, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, it was unprotected. And, and that's a theory that they continued at trial and you know, eventually they lost. And I'm suggesting, even as the alternative argument, fair use, offers this more nuanced approach of saying, okay, well, yeah, you did copy it, and we're gonna balance it with these other interests. Uh, remind me of the first point I forgot. Well, the first was just on the, I think, uh, maybe this is a lawyer's perspective, is not very musically talented, but I think we understand the meaning of words and how you're changing and adding meaning. Though so you look at the lyrics oh, yes. of Two Life Crew over uh, Roy Orbison, it was pretty clear what they were trying to say about Roy Orbison's naivete of the first work, right? Whereas with I have gotten that just from their, the rap version um, of Roy Orbison, I'm not too sure I would have said I got that change of meaning the same way. And in fact, Kennedy's 
concurrence, and Campbell sort of says that. Right? He says like you can't just do like a country version of Beethoven's Fifth and say uh, that you give just an interpretation of Beethoven. Right? I think it's a fairly accurate description. It's harder for courts and for all of us, I think, juries and, and us, <laughs> to if, to identify uh, a meaning of a song or music in music in itself. Uh, what's the meaning of art? Different, you know, artwork. Uh, that's more difficult than, uh, I think, trying to divine the meaning of uh, a play or a work of literature where you have text and you're arguing, well, this is, you know, the meaning uh, based on this symbolism, et cetera, versus trying to identify, you know, what's the meaning of blurred lines, even though that title is perfect, right, for what has happened, uh, for this debate over the scope of music copyrights, uh, it is harder talk about meaning. One thing that I suggest in the paper uh, that I think at least is worth consideration is I think it's fair to even consider the lyrics of both songs in analyzing the fair use. Uh, they, they're somewhat similar, but they have, I think, a different angle or approach. Uh, you know, it involves kind of romantic pursuit, be a nice way to put it. Uh, and you have a version of that from the 70s, and you have a version of that from 2013. So if we, you know, if we included the, the, the lyrics, uh, we, we might uh, have more to grasp in terms of the meaning. Uh, but one thing that I think in terms of uh, the fair use analysis and meaning that uh, cases like the Richard Prince case involving his appropriation art shows is that I think the court does not necessarily have to identify a specific meaning as opposed to just identifying a new meaning exists, whatever it is. We know that it's different. It's a different character, different purpose, etc. cetera. Uh, you take a look at the, in the Richard Prince case involves portrait photographs of Rastafarians. They were black and white, very serene. And, the, and they were, uh, Richard Prince copied them and did a lot to them, and it, it clearly had a different character by the time Richard Prince was finished with it. And, and the Second Circuit basically said, well, the reasonable observer, we can tell that this is a different character without necessarily identifying with you know, that much specificity you know, what the new meaning is. And even under the uh, parody cases, Inca Rose, the court does allow uh, a reasonable perception of the uh, change in meaning or parodic meaning and not necessarily have to be conclusive in the sense of, let's say, in English literature class, we have conclusively determined that this is the meaning of this uh, song or text. So there's a lot of flexibility in this uh, various analysis. Uh, yes, this gentleman. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, what's the standard that if a uh, uh, fine song writer or yeah, that's a great question, and if you take copyright, you'll study that in much greater depth. Basically, there is no formula for how much is how much copying is too much. If you copyright, if you copy, excuse me, copyrightable expression of somebody else, that is potentially infringement if it is shown that there's substantial similarity between the two uh, works, if they're the copying portion and uh, the pre-existing work that was copied. And that's ultimately left up to the jury to decide. So there's no uh, hard and fast rule that, oh, two notes is fine. You know, two notes might be infringement depending on if those notes were, you know, sort of like the key uh, element of a song, uh, at least determined by one particular court or jury. Uh, so it's a very fact-specific test and leaves a lot of leeway to the jury or the court, if the court is the fact finder, to decide this is substantially similar. 
So you know, we took this vote earlier in the class about substantial similarity, but that, I mean, you would have, if you were the jurors, you would have had time to deliberate. But that's, you know, pretty close to what happened. They're given jury instructions with the test, but then they have to go back and decide. And, you know, there's nothing, no set of rules about what they can do. Uh, yes, yeah, one more question, maybe? Yes, this gentleman. Uh, yeah. uh, I uh, wonder if the uh, I mean, author uh, would create a song that involves several other uh, uh, parts of several other sort of songs, I mean, three, four or more. And basically, if from the point of view of the one author, it's uh, not uh, substantial, but uh, if we look, we would look in it uh, generally, it's uh, basically uh, not, uh, nothing was uh, put in by this author, but uh, he just uh, took uh, a lot of uh, parts of different songs and uh, just created uh, nothing of, on his own. So from the point of view of one author, it's uh, reasonable, but in gen uh, if we were to look at it uh, in general, it's... Uh, you think it should be infringement? Yeah. Okay. So there's an interesting uh, creator, Girl Talk, uh, who does exactly what you've described. 100% of his uh, recordings, composition, uh, and, and composition, come from pre-existing uh, song uh, re recordings that he's manipulated and remixed. Uh, he had never been sued. Uh, and I think one reason uh, that I read had, that someone had suggested why he has still not been sued is that the uh, music industry fears fair use will be established, like a fair use defense that will be established in, in music. Uh, so check out his work uh, online, uh, Girl Talk. Uh, he's doing, he's copying, uh, he's a, you know, copying, borrowing, appropriating, however you want to describe it, uh, pre-existing music from a lot of artists and putting it together in ways that uh, I think he would say creates a new work. It, it, it's a new work, basically. Okay, I think we're running out of time. But I will stay afterwards, too, and answer a few more questions if you have questions. But thank you all for coming. Please do check out our calendar of events, and I hope to see you at other events, too.